This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 13th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss what Larry Persley and the Alaska Policy Forum have in common They both want to ignore the best fiscal alternative for Alaska families. Second, we explore why campaign finance reform doesn't seem to be on anyone's agenda this legislature. And third, we quantify what Representative Dan Ortiz's K-12 funding bill would mean in terms of increased taxes on Alaska families. And now, let's join Michael. Let's get started in uh, in our discussions of the weekly top three. Today, we start off with Larry Persilli, uh, who uh, earlier I was like, man, this, I mean, I know he's been a journalist, but it seems like he spent most of his adult life in governmental service in one form or another. And he's always got an opinion and I'm almost always disagreed with him. But now you're saying, oh, well, there's some similarities here between Larry Persilli and one of my favorite outlets, the Alaska Policy Forum. Let's talk about that. What what's going on? Well, Larry's got a got an op-ed over the weekend in all the major papers. I happened to pick the ADN one in the link I sent you as fertile ground. But right. uh, Larry's uh, got an op-ed in all the major papers, and it's essentially saying, uh, "Look, we need to get our prior- in his opinion, we need to get our priorities right. We need to settle on education spending, and then P- the PFD." Uh, issue the PFD debate needs to be a fallout from that. It needs to it needs to follow from from education once the education funding is settled, and we need to give priority to that. Uh, then once we've resolved that, then we can worry about the PFD. It is it is the same leftover PFD approach that Natasha started. Natasha von Imhoff started uh, in the mid two thousands. Uh, her and Bert and David Teal and others. The, the same approach now taken to education. And every year it's it seems to be, well, there's something else. There's something else we need to do first. Then we'll get to the PFD and the PFD will be the leftover uh, after after we do that something else. So Larry's Larry's editorial is all about trading the uh, uh, the trade-off between the PFD and education. He leaves one thing out. That is that there's another solution. If you want to increase education spending, there's another solution to it. And, and that's obviously to charge all Alaska families through equitable taxes uh, for the costs. I mean, if you want to increase spending, you shouldn't. But if you want to increase spending, go ahead and do it. Uh, but, the, but paying for it should be a burden that, that's, that's imposed or, or realized by all Alaska families as opposed to just middle and lower income Alaska families through, uh, through PFD cuts. He doesn't mention a word about that. He doesn't mention a word about alternative revenue measures uh, to more equitably fund his favorite spending. He just want to push. He's just he's just proposing to push the cost down to middle and lower income Alaska families. And as I and as I read it, the the similarity between that and the editorial we we talked about uh, a few weeks ago that was in the ADN by Eric Cordero from Alaska Policy Forum. The similarities between Larry's editorial and Eric's uh, struck me. Eric's uh, was all about, uh, we can't have taxes. uh, uh, Whatever else we do, we can't have taxes. Uh, We need to do something else. Well, that something else that he left out is PFD cuts. And that something else 
is um, uh, has the large PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy uh, and on 80 percent of Alaska families of, of any of the re revenue measures. But he just he left it out completely, as did as has Alaska Policy Forum's study on the issue that he was talking about. Uh, they just leave it out completely. And basically what the approach is of both these editorials is if you ignore it, it will go away. So, so Larry's approach is if you ignore taxes, if you ignore more equitable revenue measures, if you're going to, if you're going to spend, if you ignore more revenue measures, then it doesn't exist. It will go away. And we, and we have to use PFD cuts from the Alaska policy forum perspective. It's if you ignore the impact of the PFD, then it then then the PFD will go away, and and we'll be able to we'll be able to avoid taxes. Very few in this state, very few, and I'm and I'm hopeful that the that the uh, Ways and Means Committee, Ben Carpenter's Ways and Means Committee, will be one of the exceptions to this rule. But very few people in this state are willing to step up and say we need to look at everything. It's right. not just education versus the PFD. My my favorite spending versus my least favorite uh, uh, revenue measure or least favorite spending. Um, and, and in the case of the Alaska Policy Forum, it's taxes versus uh, 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 other things uh, or, or not concerning other things. Very few people are stepping up and saying, look, let's look at all of the let's look at all of the all of the issues. Let's look at all of the revenue measures. Let's look at all all the spending on the table and and consider what the best approach is they all want to consistently they all want to ignore one thing or another and it's usually the pfd that gets that, that gets ignored in the case of the alaska policy forum or its alternative revenue measures when we're talking about paying for spending in the case of in the case of uh, larry's uh, op-ed very few will step up and say let's look at all of it and the reason they don't is because they know that if they do they'll have to confront the fact that PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, and they have uncontrovertibly, and they have the largest adverse impact on 80 uh, eighty percent of Alaska families. They're worse for Alaska families. They don't want to talk about that. So, so what you do is you just ignore the rest of it, and you say, well, it's got to be. I mean, it's like Bert the other day at, in Senate Finance. It's got to be education versus the PFD. Right. It's got, it's got, it's got to be one thing or the other. There's no, there's no other alternative in here. There's no lesser, lesser impact, lower impact alternative that we can consider. It's got to be either education or the PFD. And of course, right. education is for the children. It wins that battle. And it's just, it's very frustrating to see all of these fiscal policy articles from the right and from the left that just leave out a, a real, uh, in-depth, uh, honest, straightforward analysis of all of the options that are at play. Well, it's interesting because you mentioned Ben Ben Carpenter in the Fiscal Policy Working Group. And remember uh, in the Ways and Means Committee where he said he was going to use the Fiscal Policy Group's plan to try and implement a long-term fiscal strategy. And that thing hits on everything. I mean, it hits on it hits on oil taxes. It hits on cuts. It hits on, uh, on uh, uh, new revenues. It hits on the PFD. It hits on every topic that we've been talking about in this program for years and takes it all as a holistic approach, but everybody's got their sacred cow. Everybody else, like you said out there, has got their sacred cow. And it looks like everybody wants to sacrifice the PFD on top of, on their, on their altar of whatever to prevent having to talk about all these other things. The, the reason, the reason personally is not talking about taxes is because he knows that if he mentions that you we would need taxes in order to fund explicitly mentions. I mean, PFD cuts our taxes, but if he explicitly mentions the word taxes, that we need taxes to fund education, that the whole dynamic shifts. I mean, then the top twenty percent will say, "Wait, you want us to pay a part of this? No, 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 no. We don't need this spending. Let's 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 get in here and dig into what's really going on with K through twelve and sort through all of the." sort through all of the various uh, factors and let's really figure out what it is exactly we need to be spending on before we, before we sign on for, for more spending, but by, by avoiding spending and using, you know, the PFD as the, as the counterweight that doesn't affect the top 20% only affects the other percent of, 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 of Alaska, the other 80% of Alaska families um, that then he escapes that he escapes that reaction by the top 20% 
the donor class, the ones who, you know, that the legislators listen to, the ones that hire the lobbyists, um, he escapes triggering them into, you know, looking at K through 12. So hopefully, I mean, there, there's, there's a method to the madness. I mean, Eric, uh, Alaska Policy Forum doesn't mention the PFD because they know by comparison, the PFD is worse in all the categories. PFD cuts are worse in all the categories that uh, Alaska Policy Forum is complaining about uh, than taxes. Taxes actually look better uh, on in their impact on the Alaska economy and their impact on Alaska families actually look better. Um, yeah. So, so you ignore it. So, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to confront that. I, hopefully Ben does, hopefully Ben's committee does. He started out well, he went, he had an overview of the, of the uh, fiscal policy working group conclusions. Um, and hopefully that's the, that's the direction they go an all in approach. But these, these editorials, these op-eds that are being written on both the right and the left are just unhelpful in terms of, uh, in terms of analyzing the real issues that we're confronting. The irony of this whole situation, you, you've mentioned Bert Stedman a couple times because he's really one of the prime movers and shakers behind the scenes on this. And I had to laugh when they did that piece on Donna Ardwin coming back that he was like, oh, she's just not good for Alaska because she didn't have any analysis of what the impact would be of any of these cuts. And I'm just thinking you have had no you continually go back to rake and rape over the PFD and you have no impact. You have no impact analysis of that either. But, you know, it's a good it's good enough for her, but not good enough for you kind of thing. And, of course, his latest piece was in that that hit piece we were talking about earlier about the uh, the legislative majority in the House not having their priorities or whatever it was. And he's quoted again. Sitka Republican Bert Stedman, co-chair of the Senate Finance Committee, said reducing this year's dividend to roughly thirteen hundred would allow the state to cover the Senate's education budget boost, all municipal bond debt and a projected three hundred million dollar deficit baked into the governor's proposed budget. They've already made their minds up, Brad. They already they have already decided where they're going to go. And the narrative is already out there, period. Well, Bert certainly decided where he's going to go. And, and, and look at what he's triggering. He's, tr he's trying to trigger the, the education community. Oh, good. We can have our spending. He's trying to trigger AML, the, the Alaska Municipal League. Oh, good. We can have our mun municipal bonds paid for. And he's trying yeah. to trigger everybody else in, 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 involved in the budget by saying, look, we don't have to cut anything else. We can cover the deficit. All we have to do is cut the PFD. And it's, it's just... Like, and it's, it's, and it's, battle, just, it's a battle cry for the special interests, right? I mean, that's what it was. It was a battle cry for all the special interests right. wrapped up in that one statement. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Ben Carpenter uh, would just commented in the chat room and he said, uh, as we squabble over what's visible, our short sightedness costs us long term investment and economic growths, i.e. jobs. And that's exactly it. We get, I mean, it, it is the look over here, look over here, look over here. It's Stedman, you know, activating the special interests and everything else. And you mentioned it. No, there's no mention of spending, no mention of spending anywhere. And spending is the problem. It, you know, if you give them a bunch of money, they'll just continue to spend more. They love this idea and they will always avoid the issue. It's always a revenue problem. It's never a spending problem. Um, and talking about what was something else that I saw uh, Donna say, Donna Ardwood says, what about the alternative of fixing education so students can read? <gasps> Gasp. I mean, there's an idea. You know, let's put some let's put some uh, some some guide rails on this thing and make sure that they have to hit a scholastic achievement. I mean, yesterday, Sarah Montalbano mentioned the Tennessee uh, the Tennessee uh, uh, a plan that they're doing for their funding in schools where it's tied to student outcomes. But nobody wants to talk about that. They just say what we really need is more money. That's what it's about. Well, nobody and nobody needs to talk about it, Michael, because their donors don't have to pay for it. I mean, that's 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 the travesty to me of using PFD cuts, uh, sort of setting everything else aside. They have found a funding mechanism, a revenue mechanism that pushes the costs to middle and lower income families. I mean, let, let's take Alaska families. They have found a revenue mechanism that pushes the costs away from the top 20 percent to middle and lower income Alaska families. The best, the, the closest analogy in other states is sales taxes. Um, and sales taxes are regressive and push cost to, to push more cost to middle and lower income Alaska families than the top 20 percent. But they do affect the top 20 percent, certainly more than PFD cuts. And 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 you will find in other states that at least when you're when you're talking about sales taxes, the top 20 percent, the corporate interests, the chambers of commerce, the, the 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 trade groups, the lobby groups, they'll all become engaged 
and, and talk about the need to reduce spending because they're concerned about the impact of those taxes on their businesses and on, uh, and on their, and on their owners. But here, they found, they found the holy grail. They found a revenue mechanism that doesn't trigger, doesn't affect the top 20%. And, and it's, sort of, it's sort of unlimited, at least at this point, because you know we've had, the, the PFD is so much that you can just keep dipping into it and dipping into it and dipping into it and fund this and fund that and fund the other thing. And you don't trigger the top 20%. You don't trigger the trade groups. I mean... <laughs> It, it just it it it, it it's just it, it the, the revenue mechanism that we've devolved to in this state is never going to cause pushback on spending. People will mouth those words, and the Chamber of Commerce will be concerned about oh gosh, we may ultimately burn through all of the PFD, and then we may have to talk about taxes. So we ought to be concerned about the long term, and we ought to be concerned about things like spending caps. You know, so in the long term, we'll, we'll never have to pay taxes, but it's OK to fund everything underneath the spending cap with PFD cuts. In the meantime, we just we, we, we are we are going down a road or we have been going down a road and we're continuing to go down a road where spending spending levels just aren't important to the right. top 20 percent. Right. Um, to the extent they are important. I mean, to the extent they are important, they want more and more and more of it. They want more. Um, uh, construct for their construction budget. They want more for K through 12. They want more for state employees. They want more defined benefit plans. I mean, that's that's sort of what we get uh, out right. of this. So well, and, and until, I, we, until we find a revenue source that triggers everybody, all Alaska families having to contribute to it, we're just going to keep going down this road. Well, and you just made the same point that Rob Myers did in the chat room. So we cut the PFD so that we can increase the operating budget now, keep that up, the PFD will be gone, and we'll be talking taxes again. That's what I've been saying for years, that if we continue to whittle away, I mean, oh, it's 1300 oh, it's 500 oh, it's 700 oh, it's whatever, it's zero eventually because they've consumed it all. And then they're back at you hat in hand saying, oh, well, you're not really paying your way because all these other states have taxes and we don't, so we need to tax you so that we can pay for all this stuff after they've consumed all of the PFD and everything else. Well, the way to get that under control is to make them pay now. I mean, if they're going to make middle and lower income Alaska families pay, uh, uh, contribute to government costs through in, in, in increasing amounts through PFD cuts, make the top 20% pay as well. Get them engaged now so they start putting the brakes on now as opposed to waiting until, until the PFD is entirely gone, until middle and lower income Alaska families have given up all of their benefit of all of their inheritance coming out of the PFD uh, toward government. And then maybe the top 20% will get engaged at that point. Make them get engaged now. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Number two, Brad, let's get a, let's get a, let's get a head start here on number two, uh, which is why isn't anyone talking about campaign finance reform? That's uh that's the we need to we need to talk about this. Let's get real about keeping dark money out of Alaska politics. So Paul Jenkins, Paul Jenkins from the right, has a very right. good opinion piece this weekend in the ADN uh, about dark money and the need to address dark money. But when you listen to the legislature now in the legislature last year, we had a lot of people talking about, you know, campaign finance reform. We had Alaska's uh, spend or, or campaign finance limits thrown out by the Ninth Circuit. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about replacing those. There was a lot of discussion about, you know, getting limits back on, about addressing dark money coming into Alaska campaigns, at least the state campaigns. Um, a lot of a lot of discussion around that. Um, but then we had the election and we don't we've had zero discussion. You look at the priority list in all four groups, uh, the Senate majority minority, House majority minority, it ain't there. Uh, the campaign finance reform is not is not on anybody's list, uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, and the reason is everybody who got elected <laughs> got elected under the under the unrestricted rules, and they don't want to mess with that. But look what kind of legislature we've got as a result of having unrestricted rules and having as much money come in, uh, outside money and inside money as uh, as as you know anybody can dream up. Um, so it's it, it, it is it is it is a bad thing that we're not addressing campaign finance reform. Paul Jenkins has a good op ed on that. and We'll talk about it more uh, after the break. All right. We're continuing with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, uh, the weekly top three. We were talking about number two, uh, which uh, 
which is the uh, dark money aspect of it, this discussion on it. We were talking about the piece by Paul Jenkins in the ADN, uh, and he lays out the same argument, Brad, that I've been making since the very beginning, that they continued to talk and they sold it to Alaskans as a bill of goods, that it was about dark money, failing to acknowledge that the whole thing is being funded by dark money. And really, the whole thing is just it it was a it, it, we were being gaslit the whole time. Michael, we've got the, the best legislature that money can buy, unlimited money can buy. And and we're seeing the results of that in terms of, I mean, some of the issues we were just talking about in terms of PFD cuts, uh, the, the moneyed interests don't want, the top 20% don't want to pay for things. So they use, use mechanisms, revenue mechanisms that push the costs down to somebody else. And they use their resources rather than pushing back on spending. They use their resources to push those costs, the cost of spending down on somebody else uh, through PFD cuts. And, and, and some of that, a lot of that, is due to the fact that we have unlimited campaign finance in this state now. I mean, we've got we've got outside interests that can give money. We've got inside interests that can give money um, and fund uh, legislators who are going to be responsive and and are going to be uh, uh, concerned about those issues that that, that the top twenty percent is concerned about. Um, the, the one of the ways to get that back under control is to go back to where Alaska was before. And have campaign limit campaign finance limitations, so that legislators couldn't rely can't rely on just one or two or three or four or five uh, uh, sources of income uh, of revenue for their campaigns, um, and 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 be good. And we can't have you know outside interests coming in and 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 influencing the legislature on on significant issues, uh, and not have to worry about uh, not have to worry about the consequences. We need to go back to a system where legislators need to get a little bit from a lot of people uh, in order to, to, to finance, a cam- uh, finance a campaign. A little bit from the top 20%, but they're limited in how much they can get from the top 20%, but, but quite a bit from middle and, 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 and to some degree lower income uh, uh, families as well. They need, to, they need to be sensitive. They need to have to reach out and, and find support uh, in those levels. Uh, instead of just being able to get all their funding from from one source. So Paul Jenkins is right. What's really sort of interesting about this is campaign finance reform is typically an issue you hear talked about on the left. But in Alaska, we're seeing now with Jenkins' article in particular, Jenkins op-ed in particular, we're now seeing it to be be an article that's showing up on on the right. And part of the reason is there's a lot of of left side money out there in, in, in the U.S., that's finding its way into Alaska. You and I have talked about Alaska right. being a cheap date. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of money's coming in here trying to influence campaigns, not only at the state level, but also at the local level, even at the municipal level. Um, and, and, and we're just seeing the influx of that money come in. So Jenkins has got it right. What's disappointing is we're not seeing that, to, disappointing to me, is we're not seeing that as an issue uh, uh, in being pursued by any of the caucuses um, uh, as a priority. And the consequence, I think, of that is we're just perpetuating the system we've now built, which is unlimited funding and unlimited funding from uh, from the left uh, that will that will influence elections. Well, what was most interesting about this and Jenkins hits it on the head is that, you know, this idea that this is how they sold it to us. Yet the one of the huge exemptions and loopholes in there, of course, is outside dark money for initiatives and ballot uh, questions. Uh, which, of course, is what ballot measure number two was. It was a ballot question, and they spent millions of dollars, $7 million, to be more precise, more than $7 million, uh, selling it to people. And we just, we fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. We as a people fell for it with the help of the judiciary when they decided that it wasn't a single-issue deal. I mean, it's just, it's almost the perfect storm when it's all said and done. And it is something that needs to be addressed, but we've got so much that needs to be addressed. It's like we don't even know where to begin sometimes. Well, yeah, and, and, and it, but it's iterative, right? I mean, fiscal policy is our big issue. That's, that's the issue that the state really has to confront to get back to the issues that, uh, that Ben was talking about uh, a little bit ago. But, what, but part of what's driving where we hit, end up on fiscal policy issues is campaign finance that allows a lot of, of, of large donors to come in and influence the campaign and, you know, and, 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 and influence even incumbents by threats of, We'll run against you. We'll finance somebody against you if you don't if you don't uh, adhere to our uh, adhere to our position. So it's 
the, Yes, that we do have bigger issues, but campaign finance is one of those issues that's driving some of the other issues. And if we yeah. don't get at that, then we're not really going to be able to get at the bigger issues because the people who are making the decisions on the bigger issues will continue to will continue to go down the path that their that their large donors are sending them on. Let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the path that they are sending us on right now. And this, of course, is the path, the big hue and cry, the two big hue and cries in the legislature right now are uh, we must do something about the underfundedness of education, even though it's increased 35 percent over the last 12 years. But we need to do something about the underfunding and, of course, the defined benefits. Dan Ortiz has got a couple pieces to talk about. But one of them is, of course, this new proposition of increasing the base student allocation by twelve hundred and fifty dollars. Now, again, just to make it clear, none of that money from the base student allocation is really going to make it into the classroom. This is not going to give us better educated kids. Most of that money is consumed by overhead and by administrative costs and everything else. And again, Sarah Montalbano is going to be on with us in another week or two to talk about this because there's a brand new report out talking about that, how the overhead and administrative costs in the education system is eating the system alive. But that's where the BSA, that's where the lion's share of the BSA goes. Uh, but Dan's got a plan, but it's going to cost us. Number three, Brad. Well, number, Dan's plan is going to cost us another $330 million. I mean, so so the, the Senate has said they want to start the conversation at $1,000 adjustment to the BSA. And, and let me mention, there's a great article in the Alaska landmine that breaks down how the BSA works uh, and why it's really not, really, it's not a fair way of distributing money in the first place. Uh, but uh, uh, Dan's, uh, so the basic Senate bill is, is a thousand dollars. Dan's trying to get out in front of that train and say, oh no, it ought to be $1,300. That's, that's Dan's proposal. And Dan's proposal has an ultimate price tag. The $1,300 he proposes is an ultimate price tag of, uh, of, uh, of 330, uh, an additional $330 million on top of what the roughly $1.2 billion in K through 12 spending, uh, we have, we have currently. One of the things, one of the things that 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 we talk about in Alaska and we think about is we don't have taxes, right? We say we don't have taxes. Well, we do. PFD cuts are taxes, and so I've tr I'm trying to I'm trying to find ways in which to talk to talk about the impact of of bills like Dan's and like the Senate's in a way that brings it down to Alaska brings it down to Alaska families. One way is to talk about it in terms of PFD cuts. We already have a, roughly a uh, $900 million deficit that we're funding through PFD cuts. We're already taking about $900 million in PFD cuts. That's about $1,400 per PFD that we're paying in PFD taxes to finance the deficit. We already have $1,400 uh, to finance that $900 million in, in deficits. Dan's bill would add $300 million on top of that. And we don't have the revenues coming out of oil or out of traditional sources, so it's going to have to come out of additional PFD cuts. So Dan's bill is an additional, I mean, the way I would talk about it, is an additional $480 million or $480 in PFD cuts, a total of about uh, of nearly $1,900 uh, in, in PFD cuts between funding the existing deficit as well as the additional $400, $480 uh, in PFD cuts that Dan bills would, Dan's bill would take. So Dan's bill says $300 million, not much. Hey, it's for the kids. Who cares? It's an additional $480 out of every Alaskan's pocket uh, to finance the additional bill that, that Dan comes Dan comes with. Another way to look at it is, is in terms of impact on Alaska adjusted gross income. Um, uh, Ledge Finance had in their overview of the governor's budget a calculation that showed that a $900 million deficit, to fill a $900 million deficit, you have to take 3% out of Alaska adjusted gross income, take it out of the pockets of Alaskans and shift it over to government. Uh, they were talking about it in terms of a tax, but it's the same thing in terms of PFD cuts. You're taking 3% of adjusted gross income out of Alaskans pockets and shifting it over to government to finance the, uh, to finance the deficit we have. The additional uh, uh, tax that Ortiz is talking about is another percent. So, or the additional impact of Ortiz's bill would be another percent. So instead of a 3% tax that we're already paying, 
uh, to fund government, we would be elevating to a 4% tax. What, what Ortiz is, is proposing is to take us to a 4% tax of adjusted gross income. One other way to look at it is, is just, you know, the round number of 4% really, or 3% really doesn't show the impact on Alaska families. Yes, it's 3% overall, but that 3% is really 12% on, on the, the low 25% of Alaska families, 5% on the next 25% of Alaska families, 3% on the next 25% uh, 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 of Alaska families, and less than a percent, uh, about 4% on the top 1% or the top 20% uh, of Alaska families. It's really skewed. I mean, it's, it's, it's extremely right. regressive. What Ortiz proposes is to take another 4% out of the out of the low twenty five percent, another two uh, percent out of the next twenty five, and and so on. So you, you, to think of, you need to think about these things not in terms of just additional spending, but additional taxes on Alaska families that he's proposing. If you think about it that way, people will react uh, right to it. Well, we've got to change the narrative. We've got to change the thing, and unfortunately, they've got the the news miner and and uh, and the daily news and everybody else is in their back pocket talking about it from their perspective. We've got to be the lone guys in the wilderness, I guess, barking at the wall and telling them what's going on. That's the thing, Brad. If we could get people to see this in terms of being, it's already being a tax, they would, uh, you know, maybe it would be more understandable. But, I mean, we are fighting an uphill battle here against the narrative that's being put out there by all the powers that be, the, the politicians who are kind of in control of the whole situation, and they've got their allies in the news media who, again, I was talking about the headline on that article about the House majority. I mean, it's it's just there nobody's doing what they need to do, and here's why you need to do it. And nobody's talking about the fact that we are already being taxed extraordinarily. We are. I mean, I, that part of, part of the issue is we sometimes fight, conservatives sometimes fight amongst themselves about whether the PFDs are PFD cuts are a tax or not. They are. They take they take money out of Alaska uh, uh, adjusted gross income, Alaskan adjusted gross income, and move it over to government. That's a tax. It it, it you can't you can't view it any. I don't think you can view it any other way. And 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 that is that that's a tax on Alaska citizens. That in the case of the existing deficit is, is equal to a 3% tax. Uh, that's how much we're taking out of Alaskans' pockets, out of the Alaska private sector, moving it over to government, allowing 60 people plus one to decide where that money goes, as opposed to the 650,000 people that uh, that are our PFD recipients. We're putting all that, we're putting that economic power in the hands of, of 60 plus one. Um, and, and it's a tax. We're moving that, we're, we're moving that money over. So when when Ortiz talks about when Ortiz talks about or anybody talks about, you know, I'm going to I want to increase spending by three hundred million dollars. To me, we ought to be saying, okay, what you're saying is you want another one percent tax on the economy. And it's and it's distributed unevenly so that it's another four percent on the lowest twenty five, another two percent on the next twenty five and and so on. What you're talking about is increasing taxes on the Alaska economy. You're talking about increasing the take from Alaska, from adjusted gross income and moving it over uh, uh, to government side. Now, who's in favor of an additional 1% tax on the on the Alaska economy? Who's in favor of, of taking an additional 1% out of the out of adjusted gross income? And, and, and now we're going to have a 4% total tax. I mean, I'll, even if you view Alaska, um, if you view the 3%, it's sort of reasonable compared to everybody else. But you start talking about four, five, six percent which is what they're talking about in the legislature with this additional spending, this four, five, six percent of Alaska adjusted gross income moving it over to over to government. Now you're now you're getting into the range of California, and New York, and Illinois, some of the some of the high tax states. So, well, I, and it's not even it's not an equitable distribution either, as you point right. out. It disproportionately affects the lowest income earner. So, if it was a three percent tax, great, I guess, if everybody's paying the same. But since the lowest is paying five and the upper is paying less than one half of one percent at that point for the one percent that Ortiz wants, then who, sure, go ahead. Less than one half of one percent, I'm fine with that. Oh wait, I'm down here at the bottom and it's five percent. That's a problem. I mean, that, that's that's the thing. They're not treating it as if it's a tax. Yep, exactly right. We're not talking about it as if it's a tax. It's just, it's just, oh, that's free money. 
well, it's free money that's that's coming out of the pockets. It, it's it's inheritance money that's coming out of the pockets of Alaska citizens uh, and moving over to government, just like a tax, just like a tax was. I mean, the government's grabbing it before it gets to the citizens' pockets and withholding it and diverting it before it gets to citizens' pockets. But under the statute, it's supposed to be going to citizens' pockets. So it, it is as much a tax as anything else. And I and I think I think we need to be talking about it, and, and I need to be talking about it more certainly. But we need to be talking about it in terms of a tax and in terms of quantifying these spending proposals that people have in terms of the additional tax, the additional impact it's having and adding it to the base. I mean, somebody would say, well, 1%, we can afford one. Well, it's 1% on top of the 3% that we've already got. It's now a 4% yeah. tax and then a 5% tax and then a 6 and then a 6% tax. Again, even if you don't agree with Brad's position on, you know, a flat tax or something like that, this argument makes sense because you're you would then be advocating for even if you're advocating for cuts only in spend in the spending, you have to treat this like it's a tax so that it wakes people up and it shows them that you are already being taxed. If you want to cut it back, we have a spending problem, and this argument makes that uh, makes that uh, uh, th this this point makes that argument better than anything else because we are being taxed already. Okay, you don't want it to, you'll want a flat tax. Great. Well, we're already being taxed and it's already disproportionate and do you want to add more? Yeah, exactly right. Do you want to add more to the to the $1400 that's already being taken out that's already being taxed out of the PFED? Do you want to add more to the to the 5% that's already being taken out of the out of the out of middle income Alaska families in terms of the existing uh, in terms of the existing impact of of, of PFD cuts? I, I think quantifying it that way, James Brooks in one article, in one place, talked about the impact on, on, PF, uh, on PFDs of what, the, of what the Senate majority was proposing in terms of their $1,000 BSA. He calculated it in terms of the impact on, 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 the, on the PFD. But he didn't, he didn't, I mean, you have to understand that it's a regressive tax and it's more on middle income Alaska families right. than, than it is on the on the top 20%, much more on the on the lowest 25 than it is on the top 25%. So you have to you have to take it that next step step and talk about the disproportionate effect between Alaska families that it's having. Brad Keith Lee, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Thanks again. I appreciate it. And uh, have a happy day. Thank you for coming on board. We'll talk to you again. Uh, talk to you again next week. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate you coming on board. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.